What's up, everyone? It's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, and I've got Andrew from Legal Mindset in here to talk about the Edgecombe verdict, the Halderson verdict, and we might get a little bit into politics. If you watched me on Andrew's channel, we talked about politics with him, and I happen to be doing some things in politics this week. So it just may be um, right for some discussion with Andrew. So I think it'll be a fun discussion. Thanks everybody for joining in with us. And Andrew, thanks for coming on again, man. I am happy to be on again. We had a great conversation last time. I know my viewers liked it. Your viewers liked it. So we had to make this happen again. And I am glad to hear last time I felt like I was forcing you to get political, but this time you're in Tallahassee. So you're bringing the heat. Exactly. Like yeah. So we'll talk, here. we'll talk real politics and what's happening in Tallahassee, at least in our state. Like you said, right. not a lot of us Florida lawyers that are doing this YouTube thing. So it'll be fun to talk about that at the end. But I think we need to start out talking about Theodore Edgecombe, talking yes. about the verdict that came down. Hot um, off the presses. Yesterday, we got the verdict in. So this is new, 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 new information. Yeah, I don't know. Well, your timing may be different, but it was just a couple hours ago here that we got the Edgecombe verdict in where he, I think his lawyers are going to, I don't want to say spin it because I don't like when people say lawyers do things like that, but I think they're going to say it was a win for them that he was guilty of just first degree reckless, reckless. homicide, yes. not first degree intentional murder homicide, right? So technically criminal defense lawyers sometimes look at this as wins. Sometimes it is a win and your client's not going to prison for the rest of their life. Um, they're going away to prison for a long time still potentially. And we'll talk about what those sentences look like, but just, I know you've been on Ricada a bunch yes. throughout this trial, right? So you've been watching this trial. Um, you've kind of seen how it's gone from beginning to end. Give me kind of your thoughts of how you think the trial went. I mean, this was a crazy trial. This was a great one to look at in terms of do's and don'ts for what to do for both prosecutors and defense attorneys. I think um, one thing I will say, and to start with a very positive thing, because I, I, I like to start with something that's a clear positive, some real good stuff, is the prosecution I love that the prosecution was an example of ethical prosecution in this case. Yeah. I think that they did a, a great job in terms of um, going as far as they needed to go and not going further. They didn't use demonstratives or a bunch of um, sensational photos like, for example, um, they didn't go through as many photos as Binger tried to go through in the Rittenhouse case or in many other cases where they'll try to show you the gore and the intensity of the situation in order to you know, emotionally drive you over that edge. Um, they didn't do that. They also could have pushed uh, Edgecombe much harder on his um, pro his other criminal affairs um, based on his testimony. Uh, as you guys in the audience may not know, you normally can't go into people's crimes, the things they've done in the past, um, normally. However, Edgecombe, due to the way he was testifying and denying everything and saying he didn't know or didn't recall, they got into a situation where they could have said, hey, Edgecombe, here's your criminal complaint. Read this off to me. You know, Let's go through the details. They didn't do that. They did as much as they needed to without going too far over the line. And I think that was exemplary. And they did a great job keeping their witnesses a short length. Not necessarily long. Closing was a good length. The opening was a good length. Everything seemed timed out right. They kept a good rapport with the judge. The judge was very uh, cognizant of the law. We can talk about the the, the politics with the judge. Um, now, on the defense side, I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of your trial strategy. Because to me, and I've said this, this seemed like a... I called it like a social justice strategy, but that's my my personal take on this is they were going with a in, an angle. Sure. So first, well, we're talking about the prosecutor. So and I talked kind of on some other videos and in some comments with some people about how I thought the prosecutor was doing a great job throughout their case in chief and the first couple witnesses of the defense's case in chief. He was short. He was right to the point. I like an assertive prosecutor. I like a confident prosecutor. I like one that likes to keep witnesses where they should be. Um, realizes when he's kind of got the judge with him, but doesn't take it too far, like you said. And just to clarify a little bit, because I know we've talked about this on my channel before, and I know you know, you just kind of explained yeah. it, the second step. So you can talk about crimes that witnesses have committed, but the way you do it is, have you been convicted of a crime and how many, yes. right? And you can say three, like Edgecombe did. But you're not allowed to get into what those crimes are, which is what you're saying. And he opened the door by saying, I don't know what kind of lawyers they were. I didn't even know if they were criminal defense lawyers because his whole right. excuse for running was I needed to find representation. I needed to find a criminal defense lawyer. And the prosecutor did a great, I thought that was his best part on cross to say, 
yes. wait a second, you needed to go find a criminal lawyer. You had two criminal defense lawyers. And then I thought it was kind of gross how, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I thought it was kind of gross that um, Lamar got into how public defenders don't care about their clients, oh. especially if they're minorities and private lawyers care about their clients more. I was like, seriously That's you're triggering you me with? right now i mean yeah I, I'm, I'm jumping out of my seat when you say that peter because i mean that is like it's so offensive and it, it's it's so it, i've met so many public defenders that are great people they are true believers they truly believe in you know innocent until proven guilty they're passionate there's some people who are lifers and there's some people who have the most criminal defense experience especially murder experience that are public defenders they are good lawyers they are competent they absolutely do know what they're doing and they do care the only thing they're limited on is the resources they're provided yes they don't normally have as many resources as the state but that doesn't mean they're incompetent lawyers in fact they might be better than your local criminal defense attorney and the services you're going to get from them the level of expertise and skill you're going to get from them listen here's the truth there are good public defenders and there are bad public defenders. There are good private lawyers and there are bad private lawyers, plain and simple. And to draw just a line over all public defenders and say they don't care about their clients, especially their black clients, to me is a joke because that's just not true. And there are tons of minority public defenders too. So it's like, what are you mm -hmm. talking about? What do you, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. And I didn't like that kind of line of thinking. And like you're saying about him being an ethical prosecutor, I probably would, and I don't know, I, I go back and forth. I can understand why he didn't, but it probably would have been embarrassing for him to be like, well, how much did you pay your lawyers in this case then? Because that's all they talked about. They the opened the door. They opened the door for that, Peter. $40,000. Yeah, absolutely. Usually that's absolutely not admissible. But in this case, I mean, they tried to waive privilege 50 times throughout this case too, and it didn't end up happening. But I agree with you. I think the prosecutor did a good job up until he crossed the defendant, in my opinion. I thought that was much weaker than I expected. I thought it was going to be a bloodbath. I thought he was going to drive a truck through everything he said. And I actually think the defendants, can you repeat the question? I was just um, defending myself or whatever he kept saying over and over again. I actually think that knocked the prosecutor off balance a little bit. What did you think about that? Uh, okay. Well, this is my kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to answer, but I'm going to ask you a question back. So I do think that obviously to me, when I was watching that, and I think most of the other lawyers on Ricada and we were all watching it through, um, we were thinking the same thing. We're kind of synced up that this is a strategy. Somebody told him to do or told him or insinuated. I don't want to accuse their attorney of coaching, but right. You know, coaching uh, he is in the smart. Legal world. I'll tell you right now, Theodore Edgecombe is smart. He's not a stupid man. I can tell because I've seen a ton of criminal defendants get crossed. Right. He is not stupid. He mm -hmm. was able to know when to answer like that. He did mm -hmm. not get tripped up by some good questions. Now he had bad answers because, I think he had bad facts, but he, I don't think he really got super tripped up by a question here or there. I think mm -hmm. he tried to work his way. But when you do that with a lawyer, you're going to lose most of the time. It's the same thing when I'm crossing a surgeon. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to argue with him about his surgical technique because he's going to know more about that than I am. And you end up losing every you. time. So yeah. I don't think he was stupid, but go ahead. Continue. No, no, no. No, you're absolutely right about that. I don't think I, I mean, I think. Maybe the way I characterize this, he's clever, you know, because you might not yes. say, okay, his his formal IQ may not be very high, but he knew what he was doing. And it was clear in the difference between his answers to his own attorney versus the other attorney and them trying to say, oh, you're scared of the other one. I don't buy that BS. That's that complete horrible. BS. He's not scared of anybody. He's He was flat emotionally. He wasn't crying or anything it is to show fear. That was a horrible. And it lost credibility, his credibility as a witness when he would not do that with his own attorney and then yet do that with the other one as if he was deaf or couldn't hear. But um, my question to you is how would you have handled a witness like that? Because um, you know, I have observed a lot of courtroom stuff. I've been in the courtroom a couple of times, but chiefly I'm um, outside of the courtroom on the corporate world, you know, in that other world. So uh, for you as a trial attorney, how would you have handled a witness like that? Who's coming back with the same answers to almost everything. There was like a rinse, rinse, wash, repeat, you know, and I don't, I, you know, can you repeat the question or I was acting in defense or I was defending myself, you know, that sort of recycled uh, responses. How would you have dealt with that? Yeah, I'm looking for his exact quote here. Um, I reacted to protect myself from being harmed. That was the exact That's quote he was saying. So how I would deal with, so there's a couple different ways to deal with both of these. So the first one, when somebody asks me to repeat the question, usually I just repeat the question and I'll repeat it until they give me a good answer. Because if you're actually asking a coherent question, which sometimes the state was, sometimes it wasn't, but 
when you're asking a coherent question and you keep asking at the same time, I think the jury gets more annoyed at them as opposed to kind of changing the question or bouncing back and forth. I also, I literally would have taken three days with him if I had to. I would have kept hmm. him on the stand for three days. I would not have tried to get through it. I realize we're always a little apprehensive of, is a jury going to hate us for keeping us up here? But I think every, it was clear to everybody watching that he was causing the delay. Yes. And the, I reacted uh, in order to protect myself. I don't, uh, the prosecutor was obviously very, I don't want to say scared. He did not want to use those words in asking the question. He wanted to say when you use the murder weapon or when you shot a man in the head and those buzzwords and buzz phrases, and he got those out plenty, which was fine. But I think once he kept saying that, I would say, okay, when you reacted to protect yourself and shot him, then this. And I would have just added that to the beginning of my question because that was already his answer. So if you bring that answer into the question, now he's got to answer your question or he's just repeating the question that you're asking him. So I would have asked some similar questions, but I would have gone into detail with this guy because especially when they talked about, oh, they didn't get the videotape from this time on this block and the state brought it up and close how they're like, he wasn't even at that block. He said he was two blocks yeah. east of where the defense attorney came up in opening statement and said they didn't have the video from this block. Well, guess what? If they would have, still wouldn't have showed it according to their client. And I also think it's hilarious how the lawyers were just filing motions and basically admitting that they didn't even talk to their client before filing a motion saying that our client is going to say this. He basically that admitted insane. that. I was that like, was insane. you're going to wave a, a criminal defendant's Fifth Amendment right and their attorney-client privilege to put something in a motion and then the client's not even going to say that. And you're going to say, I didn't even talk to him. That was not a good look. That was not a good look. So that's how I would have handled it. And yeah, I think I would have just taken a lot more time than he did. Cause you know, and I know representing defendants and representing plaintiffs, cause this happens a lot of time in plaintiff's personal injury cases. I'm sweating while my client's up there getting crossed. My mm -hmm. shirt would be soaked because that's <laughs> when you're most nervous. Cause I, I thought it was funny. I always said, I'm scared of the prosecutor, but you're not just scared of the prosecutor because he's a tall, bald white man. You're scared of the prosecutor because you're scared you're going to give the wrong answer and end up in prison for murder, which I think was what ended up getting developed through even the defense was saying he didn't want to give the, the wrong answer. So right. that, that's what I thought was interesting, too, is they were he was scared of him. Well, yeah, he was scared of giving the wrong answer. He was scared of turning himself in every criminal defendant that either has committed a crime or is is accused of committing a crime or there's probable cause for his arrest. Every one of them is scared. None of them want to go to law enforcement. All of them are scared of what could happen to them in prison. None of them are saying, oh, great, this is going to be fun. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So that's not a legitimate excuse to flee. No. And, and there were so many facts in there. And I agree with you. I think that both on the uh, cross and on the recross, I expected more from the prosecution. I expected them to go further and to go into some details. And he said so many facts during his direct that were just so ridiculous. Stuff like uh, we were all making fun of the, the heat of the Kia Soul. You know, I mean, come on. I don't know when you've ever felt the heat of a Kia Soul, but it's like, okay, at what point here playing the video and using, for example, the video during the cross, say, like, okay, at what point here were you feeling the, the car? The part where you're 20 feet away from it or the part where you're not even on the, the road anymore? At what point are yep. you doing this? You know, just totally impeach his testimony because so much of it was just, just ridiculous. I, for example, at what point did you hear the engine? Because he was already around the corner and kind of well off before when he said he was able to see and hear the car. Don't even think it was physically possible. So a lot of these other things he said, I would just walk through the video, just play the video and show clearly how ridiculous his statements are because he made so many statements that were just absolutely preposterous. Um, so uh, yeah. yeah, I would have, I would have belabored it. And the thing is, it is painful. It's painful to watch. Absolutely. But the jury is blaming him because he is clearly being the obstructive one, not the attorney. And it's not just because he's a late witness you can do this with. Exactly what you're saying. When you play the video and you say, tell me when to stop the video, when you felt the heat of the Kia Soul. Because we've, we've done that with law enforcement officers who have their doctorates and who are professional witnesses. When we have a client that's good on a DUI uh, tape where they do the field sobriety exercises perfectly, yet he circled that she stepped off the line here. And I'm like, okay, tell me in the video where she steps off the line. Tell me to pause it. They miss it every time because she didn't step off the line. And they're mm -hmm. saying, well, you had to be there in person. And I don't think a jury buys that. I think if a jury yeah. has a video, they're going to believe the video. And I think exactly what you said, if you go through, if he's going to get that detailed, and I always get nervous about clients getting that detail, but if he's going to get that detailed, make him eat it. Yep. hundred percent. So what'd you think about the defense overall? Uh, I think the defense. Okay. I mean, there were, they, I'm not going to say they had no points, but I'm going to say, cause there were moments and the different attorneys, um, 
you know, dealt with it differently. But I think B Ivory was the one that was just the one that I was just face palming because some of the, the questions he asked actually opened up more things for the prosecution, gave more opportunities for the prosecution to attack than he needed to give. Um, I think that coming at it from this angle, which is very interesting of an accident, which it seemed like, especially during the motion hearing there at the end, when they were talking about the self, um, the self-defense instruction, you could see that they wanted the reckless, like you said. So they might consider that a win, you know, they're saying, because they were they were debating that um, towards the end there. And the judge was like, I'm going to kill you guys because we're not changing the charges at this point. Um, but I think I think you're right. They may have been angling for that from the beginning or pushing for that from the beginning. But I think this angle, when you come with this this angle where, OK, this is a racially motivated thing, this is a systemic racism in the police, you've got to provide some evidence of that. You've got to have something. You can't just come in with this bare naked accusations and then have your client, you know, just say, oh, well, he dropped the N-bomb, you know, to, the, to a David Duke level of, uh, you know, I mean, essentially this immigration attorney, you're pretty much making him into essentially a Klansman at this point because he's just been racially slandering you the entire time with his Filipina wife in the car. You know, I mean, it, it just was something that was completely not credible and there wasn't anything to back that up. My thing is, is that if you're going to take that approach, have some sort of other evidence, have some sort of other testimony, other factors in there that you know you're going to bring in if that's your theory of the case that you're going to propose that they accept. Otherwise, you could just use one that doesn't key in on that. Um, there were so many other angles they could have taken this that might have been more credible of a defense. Um, I also don't think the I think the accident thing was very, very, very weird when you have so many people testifying that he had his arm outstretched. But it worked. But it, it work. worked. That's all I'm saying. I hear people making fun of the whole accident argument that the defense attorneys made, but it worked. And there's a chance their client can see the light of day. So, so the defense, yes. here's some things. <laughs> Is a chance. I see. I see your point. I see your point. It's like it's weird for people to conceptualize that a guilty can be a win in some cases. Exactly. But you'd be surprised. Sometimes we win at sentencing. Sometimes we get a guilty verdict and it could get up to 60 years and they only get 20. And that's a win. You know, sometimes that happens. But so I think as far as the defense goes, what I felt like he had a certain presentation style, especially uh, Lamar. He had a yes. certain presentation style. Um, and I, I have some buddies in law school that had a similar presentation style in mock trial and some juries love it and eat it up. And yes. I, I personally didn't mind it at all. Like I, I kind of liked the two attorney styles. Um, but I don't think he's a criminal defense lawyer. I think he's more of a PI lawyer, maybe, maybe civil rights lawyer, which is why, or that's what he's trying to kind of be more think, of. Yeah. That's yeah. how he kind of got into this. And I think he may have missed some concepts of opening the door. I think he may have thought once he won a motion, a pretrial motion, that the, the, the state was not allowed to get into this. He mm -hmm. may not have understood the concept of, but if I go to a certain point, then maybe they'll open the door and be able to talk about it, even mm -hmm. though I won that pretrial mm -hmm. motion. So that's one thing. The second thing, I think this is just a total guess, and I'm not saying anybody did this. I don't think they prepared enough with their client sitting around a table like this with the two lawyers and their client going through everything, talking to your client about what your opening statement is going to be talking to your client about what you're going to use these witnesses for and getting their client on the same page. Also something we do in trial prep, cross your client, cross him, cross all mm -hmm. these people you're planning on using that poor retired police officer that took the stand and talked about how the investigation was inept and they just didn't do everything. And this man didn't even look at the body cam footage and he didn't even get all the reports and he didn't even get all of the information that was printed out and handed to him on a silver platter. Yet he is literally called to testify that they didn't do everything they should have. They never mm -hmm. crossed him. They never brought anybody else in that used to be a prosecutor to cross him, whatever it may be. We do that. You know, I mean, that that's important to have these witnesses prepared for cross-examination, not to lie, but just to say, Oh, wow. You're right. Can you give me those other body cam videos? Because if these are the questions I'm going to be asked, I'd like to be prepared, especially if I'm a paid expert in the case. So I thought the defense did have some good points. And I thought, okay. And I know a lot of people are hating on the defense because of maybe they didn't like how relaxed some of their tone was and some of their questions mm -hmm. were and some of their arguments were. I think juries like that sometimes because it's easier to understand, but they did a couple of things. They got enough facts out through Edgecombe that you could at least make a factual argument for the fact that he was in fear 
for his life for serious bodily harm. They got enough facts out that he retreated and wanted to be done with this situation as illogical as it sounds that you can punch a guy in the face, then I'm done. I'm walking away. So now he can't come do anything to me in light. Any of us that went to college know that that's not the case. So, so, you know, that didn't make any sense, but at least it gave them facts to argue to the jury in closing. And right. then the accidental shooting. Okay. I didn't agree with it. I think it's impossible that it was an accidental shooting, but I think that there's one fact we can be pretty sure of the jury at least yeah. believed some of what Theodore Edgecombe said. Yes. I don't think they bought that this was a race thing, like you're saying. And I think that that diminishes the value of real cases that deal with yes. race, like the yes. federal yes. trial we have going on in Georgia. I think it diminishes those cases. And to bring Ahmaud Arbery into this, who is a kid that was running away, okay, whatever he was doing, he was clearly running away from guys he wanted no part mm -hmm. of. You went up and punched a guy in the face and then ran away. It's not right. the same thing. It's right. not the same thing as Ahmad Arbery. So to use his name in this to me is just, it's a, it, it's, it's not a good uh, deal for Ahmad Arbery for you to for use his name in this, but it was a clear so strategy. I, it was a clear strategy course. to drop to name drop him. And, and I actually missed, I was told that early on there, they dropped Floyd's name. I, I missed that day of that or that bit yeah. of the testimony. But the point is to keep continually name dropping clearly fits in with that strategy. And like, and I think you're exactly right. Um, earlier when you were talking about, I think, where B. Ivory is going to shine is I think he's going to be a great civil rights attorney. He's going to be like a Benjamin Crump. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's going to be going in and- Ben you know, Crump, dude, that's Tallahassee, Parks and Crump back oh, in the day. All right, I, used all right, to, all right. I used to practice my trial in, they have a courtroom hey. in front of their office. They literally have a courtroom like in the lobby of their office and we used to practice yeah. mock trial. And those dudes are awesome, you especially Daryl Parks, his old partner. I love that mm -hmm. dude. Ben Crump, I don't know as well. I know who he is, obviously, but yeah. I don't know as well. But yeah, those- It's a that's very a great, prof it's a profitable niche. I'll just say I can that. think with of a worse person to follow in their footsteps. Settling, settling cases with cities, you can make a bunch of money. You can just do so that. That's your only. That's your all job, and you don't ever sure. have to go to trial. Even you never even have to go to trial. You can just settle. That's it. You know, make public statements and settle, which I think he'll be great at. Um, and and clearly, a strategy like that works out in a public media campaign. It does not necessarily work out in trial. And but one thing I, I'm, I was thinking about here, because you and I were, were not his attorneys. We weren't sitting there. We weren't, you know, we're not sitting there. We weren't talking to him. We don't know how easy or difficult of a client he could be because not all clients are built the same. Whether you're a litigator, whether you're transactional, whatever type of lawyer you are, you there's some clients are very easy to deal with. They listen to you. They pay attention to you. They follow your strategy. They follow your advice. Some clients are going to do what they're going to do regardless, and they expect you to pick up the pieces and to fix everything, regardless of what they do. And now, the, you know, they view you as a get-out-of-jail-free card, which that those are two wildly different types of clients. And, of course, I always say if it's possible, avoid, you know, get into a practice if you're a lawyer, get into a practice where you can avoid the difficult clients and, you know, take the better clients. Yeah. But that's yeah. my two and a half cents. So my thought is, I don't know how difficult it seemed to me like Edgecombe would not be the easiest client. Like Edgecombe might be the type of client who has his own idea of how he's going to do things, has his own idea of what he's going to say. And like you said, especially because he's clever. He's not a complete idiot. He thought he had this strategy of what he was going to say, or I don't, you know, can you repeat that? You know, and, and just this strategy. So he might have been doing that regardless of what the lawyers have, have got to say, maybe because he's been in other criminal trials and he knows that's what you say. So maybe he might do whatever he's going to do regardless or say whatever he's going to say, regardless of what the lawyers advise him of. Potentially. Yeah. So we talked about the prosecutor, we talked yeah. about the defense lawyers. The people want to know, what are our thoughts on the judge? Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. I okay. Thought so he was a little grumpy, but like how he knows I lawyers that. like to make BS points from time to time. All right. What do you think about the judge? I, I love the judge. We got judge Hawkeye, but you know, he, he <laughs> was, he, he, I loved him. I mean, you know, I love a good, uh, a good Polish judge, but I mean the, he was straightforward with his rulings, very clear. And when there was like a legal discussion, I really liked his discussions on the motions. So when the, you know, the jury's out and they're going back and forth in the motions, he gave like very clear, concise legal logic that I could follow the reasoning as a lawyer I could say, okay, here's what he's weighing on. Here's how he's pushing one side and pushing another side. And he was not taking any BS. And I, and I like that. I like that. Um, he, he didn't allow what happened in the Rittenhouse case. Whereas, you know, you had the prosecution bringing these BS points and, you know, Schroeder was just listening to it. He was not having any of that. And I absolutely enjoyed that. And frankly, Peter, for me, tell me if you're wrong, you know, but I remember when I was in Orlando, it reminded me of a lot of judges there. 
that just do not put up with BS because they view it as wasting your, the court's time. You're wasting everybody's time. It's really a, a judge by judge thing. Like I haven't been mm. in a single county or jurisdiction where all the judges yeah. are one way. Right? Never so all of them. A, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's more federal judge type. Federal mm -hmm. judges are like that for the most part. Um, here's what I'll say. I th I love judges that can make decisions. And he was a judge that could make decisions, quick decisions. Um, we didn't have to hear a bunch of argument from every, every yeah. objection. But I will say, if I was the prosecutor, I would be nervous that he opened up appellate issues with yeah. how he spoke to the defense lawyers, how he didn't let them get into certain things that didn't even matter. Like it wasn't going to hurt my case as the prosecutor. He didn't let anybody explain their answer, which I understand there's an argument for not letting you explain your answer, especially on cross. You'll have redirect. But if I was a if I was a witness, I would have said I can't answer that question without an explanation. I can't answer that question with a yes or no. And he can't force you to. And if he tries to force you to, you say, Judge, I'm under oath. I can't answer that question and commit perjury with a yes or no answer. I've had smart witnesses do that before when judges try to force you to answer. And listen, I'm a lawyer. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I cross-examine. Mo most of the trial is me cross-examining witnesses, right? In most trials, the prosecution has all the witnesses. So mm -hmm. cross is important and I like to keep them in a box and I wish I could get them to answer yes or no. And if a judge is going to let me, I'm going to hold them to that. But at some point, you've got to let them explain their answers, especially experts and especially the actual parties in the case. So I'd be a little bit nervous about that. I would hate how he spoke to the defense attorney in front of the jury. Um, because again, I don't want to open any issues with a case like this. I feel like I've got a strong case. I feel like I can go and convict this guy on the facts. I don't want any issues for appeal that I'm going to have to worry about that an angry or grumpy judge is going to have to deal with. But overall, I thought that he made calls, kept it moving. And I, he was fair to both sides when he was saying, let's keep this moving. Tell me how many witnesses you're going to have. Tell me how long it's going to take. And isn't it just like the state attorney to act like they had more witnesses than they had? Always. They love to do that. We have yeah, all these yeah. rebuttal witnesses. We have all these extra witnesses coming. They always act like they got more witnesses than they have to try to scare the defense lawyers. But uh, I like the I like the point where they almost were able to bring in the defense counsels. I forget if she was a lawyer or a paralegal or paralegal, something. Paralegal, like yeah. Yeah, about to bring her in because she said she was a detective, allegedly, allegedly, you know, at some point, which was uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of unorthodox things. I think they tried that that didn't go over great. But like I said, I think they got enough points across and they gave the jury enough to hold on to where they were able to come up with a compromise verdict, which usually feels like I I'm telling you right now, I don't think the prosecutor is excited about that conviction. I don't think no. I think he did a really good job. Mm hmm. And I think that I think that they had more than enough evidence and lack of credibility of Edgecombe and I mean video evidence to to just put this in at the highest possible charge here, you know, or just get or just get across the board guilties. Um, I think that would have been totally justified in this case. Um, they got something, you know. I think that's some measure of justice, and I think that is what we're just going to have to sit with in this case. Yeah, I'm thinking. I was feeling probably more like second degree. Uh, second degree intentional homicide is kind of what I was, yeah. what I was feeling more of. But I mean, if you're going to buy that the gun accidentally went off, which I don't really believe, but there's also, I don't buy other, the Al, Al Adam Baldwin defense, you know, <laughs> there's yeah, definitely not. Uh, but there's, but there are other explanations for reckless homicide, which is, you know, maybe he didn't mean to shoot him in the head, but he was trying to shoot a warning shot or trying to shoot him somewhere else. And he ended up killing him, which is still showing utter disregard for human life. So I think there are some other explanations for reckless homicide than just an accidental firing. I do think that's what the defense went with. And that's what the defendant said. But in my mind, I can kind of see that more than some juries incorrectly believe that intentional first degree homicide has to be, I had a plan. I went yes. to my house. I got the gun. I planned he was going to be here at the stairs. And that's what, that's not what you have to have for intent for first degree mm -hmm. homicide. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's transition now into Halderson. <laughs> okay. We're transitioning from, you know, okay. Was this self-defense or not? Actually a case in which frankly, especially at the outset, I will say Edgecombe, I thought was a toss up. Now we move over to Halderson where I think going into this, the facts were looking bad and at trial, it just even looked worse. Yeah. So, so this is just a little tease for my Friday live, because I'm hoping to have some extra stuff, but I want to talk to you in preparation for that as well. So the, one of the public defenders reached out to me on the Halderson case, and it was started out with a not so nice DM um, about us covering part of the case. But I was like, listen, I thought I was fair. I was objective. And I just kind of broke down how I, what I thought. And I actually went through what I would do differently. And she's like, 
well, I wish people knew how the laws were a little bit different, things you could do, things you couldn't do, what we tried to do and why. So I'm going to have a talk with her. I don't know if she's actually going to come on the show or not, but I'm going to have a talk with her more about why they did what they did, what their strategy was, what they were trying to do. So let's start with the PD. Okay. They were public defenders, which mm-hmm. we just talked about public defenders. How there are some good ones, some bad ones. in when we mm-hmm. talked about um, Edgecombe. So what mm-hmm. did you think of how the defense handled this case before we get to the prosecution? Okay. Let me say one thing about the defense. So when I was in, I did, um, I did a little bit of trial team, you know, I was in the, the closing argument competition. I remember that in opening. And when I was, when I heard their opening and closing, I was like, these are, well, the closing is another thing, but the opening, especially the opening was what I would call a de minimis opening, you know, a, at, at the end of the day, no matter what the client is, it can be on any charge, anything, you can always get up there and do a bare bones, reasonable doubt opening opening statement you can just get up there due process of law reasonable doubt don't even talk about the facts just these are the presumptions and give it to them and and just that's agnostic and that's what they did and she did it in a interesting way it was you know in comparison to the prosecution's opening it seemed a little bit inadequate because it was quite short it lacked any specific facts to the case it really said nothing about Chandra Halderson um but I think that when she she executed it in a fine way, she did her job in a in a fine manner. I don't think she was incompetent. I don't think that anything they did was unethical or incompetent. I don't right. think they were breaking the rules at, at all. And I think isn't they that made funny? A- Nobody cares about that anymore. But it's like you know right. what? They had a tough client in a tough case. They didn't do anything unethical. They didn't try to do anything shady. Now mm-hmm. listen, I don't know if I would say I think they did a good job. Okay, and I'm, I'm fine saying that, knowing she's probably going to hear that. Yeah. But. I think they I'm not did saying that either, by the way. Points. I want to make it right. clear as well. I'm not saying that either. And the reason for that is because a, a, what happened pre-trial, right? And what, what happened with all the rulings of the judge and whether the gun could come in or not and whether or not they could point the finger at somebody else or what they could do, you still have to make certain objections during trial. You still have to ask certain questions during trial in order to protect that for appeal. And that's where I think they potentially dropped the ball more than yes. – what their strategy was because from the beginning of the case that they don't have a lot to work with here. Like this is, and and I think the prosecutors did a great job. We can talk about them if you want to think it should be a short conversation because is there any easier case to try? Fantastic though. The opening, I covered that one. That was one of the best openings I've heard recently because it was a story and it, it, that guy was such a good storyteller. If you guys want to just go in, watch the Halderson opening. If you haven't watched it at all, just watch the prosecution's opening. That is how you do an opening. Even me as a lawyer, I was paying attention. I was sitting there like, oh man, this guy's telling the story. And the way he hit the paces, he gave timing, he gave spacing. He did it over a lie on the PowerPoint. He used it strategically. He used pictures strategically. Everything was to enable the story in your mind, which just clicks and makes sense. And everything fit together as part of that story. And they had some gaps in the story, some because we don't know. The big gap is how are they actually killed? We really don't know anything. We have such a big gap. But he brought that together as part of the story. So you kind of, it's like, you kind of know what happens. It's like the movie, when the movie kind of clips away and then clips back and there's pools of blood. Well, it's like, well, you know how the pool of blood got there. You, your mind fills in yeah. the blank because our minds as humans are very creative things. We fill in blanks. He did a good job of doing that, a great job of doing that. And um, I thought it was great how he had witnesses yeah. up and down, quick, make one point. You get up, say Halderson said this, sit mm-hmm. down. You get up, show how it was a lie, sit down. You get mm-hmm. up, show how you saw him, where the body parts were, sit down. You get up, talk about the saw and how you could tell that this was the saw used and you found it in this tarp. You sit down. You get up, show the receipt. He bought the tarp. You sit down. You get up, talk about he got the ice. You sit down. You get up, talk about how you walked. You know, it was just like, it wasn't like, can I have all of your background and experience and who you are and how you know about HVAC systems before you came to the house? It was just quick and but again, I, I just thought there were points to be had on cross. Even if mm-hmm. some people talked, they were like, wow, those would have been great points to make. Other people said it wouldn't have made a difference if you would have asked the HVAC guy, well, did you smell a dead body when all the windows were open? No. Okay. So what is that supposed to prove that the windows were open? Was he airing it mm-hmm. out for the dead body or not? Because if he was, the HVAC guy should have smelled a dead body. The pork roast or the pig roast. It's like, what does that prove? Why are you able to even, even talk about that? Objection. That's not relevant. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. who's going to testify that pig and body smells the same? And how can we prove that? You know, mm-hmm. I just, there were some points Th- like that, that was, where it was weird. Just sad. 
Yeah, I, that that exact point was when I was like, weird. It's like, okay, well, it, it's a barbecue, but like, you know, who's smelled human before? Like, most people have not done. My family runs a funeral home, and I haven't smelled human before. You know, it's not like it's a common thing. You know, where where people know what know how to identify it. Burnt um, hair. You know, that's about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the best you're gonna get. Um, but I think that you're exactly right when you mention about preserving points for appeal as well. I think that's something that you always have to think about, even if you know you have a guilty client. And that's, of course, one of the theories with this. It's interesting that we will never know. You and I will never know. But it did Halderson pretty much confess to his attorneys or, you know, insinuate that, OK, maybe I did this, you know, and they knew that. So they had to, you know, they have to give him a defense, but they can't make anything in bad faith or, you know, based on ethical rules. They can't make certain arguments. Um so, so well, maybe that's why they weren't, they weren't, uh, that's one, you know, just theory I was thinking of, but they can still preserve it for appeal. And, and you've got to be vigorous to do that. And you've got to make stuff, even if you know, you're going to lose, you still make the motion. So, so think for a second, what you'd want to know from that lawyer, because I've got some things I'd want to know from her. And obviously she can't violate privilege. So I understand that, yes. but I am positive that they did not want to go to trial. People are commenting in the chat. People have said in comments the whole time, how is this? case even a thing how is halderson going to trial there's really only one explanation that's because he wanted to go to trial and it's his constitutional right he also gets lawyers appointed to try that case for him and this is mm -hmm. what that looks like in case you didn't know mm -hmm. this is your constitutional right to counsel due process you're you're entitled to due process you're entitled exactly. to a trial this is what you're going to get this is what your de minimum like like i said the minimum defense this is the minimum you're going to get you're going to get in there. You're going to have some lawyers. They're going to be there. They'll make a couple objections for you. They'll get up and do an opening. They may or may not do a closing. And, you know, th that's it. You know, they don't have to present any witnesses. That's not required of them. And, you know, if they've certainly got no evidence, they're not required to present any counter evidence to bring up any, you know, points or facts. So this is what you will get in your case. And is it we can have a debate. This is a political policy debate, you know, on whether that's enough, whether we need more. But that's separate and outside of this is reality. And this is something that goes on not just in Halderson, but it goes around in courtrooms across America. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if you think of anything that you think would be interesting to hear from her, let me know. Because okay, I'm going to talk to her and we'll, and we'll see what we come up with. But I am shocked that she got salty at you specifically, Peter. You, you must have really triggered her. I, you must have really pushed her over the edge. If you I know, was going to guess, now listen, if I was going to guess, she sent that to 50 lawyers, not just me. That, that would be oh, my okay, guess. Okay, I may okay. be the only one that responded. I don't know. Because she was saying stuff like say it to my face and whatever in her, in her post. And I was like, I don't, like, I'm happy sure to hurt? talk to you. Positive. And I, oh, am, okay. I am verifiably positive that it was her. And I talked to her. I've already had back forth her. And I was like, listen, I respect what you guys do. I'm not saying you're a bad lawyer. I agree this is a tough case. And so we've had some good conversation now. And she seems like a very nice person. And she seems like she takes her job seriously and she loves her job. I just think this was a really tough case and a really tough client. But and I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I get it. But Peter, that's exactly what I'm talking about. These people, you know, when B. Ivory gets up there in the Edgecombe case and says, oh, these people are bad lawyers. No, these are good lawyers. And they really Absolutely. care. They really care. She's responded that way to you because she cares. Exactly. A lawyer who doesn't, who doesn't care, who's just like, this is my 500 bucks. She didn't lay down and more. die. Yeah. No, no, no. She's she's Correct. passionate about this case. And, you know, she's going to be thinking about it. She may even lose some sleep about it because she you know, believes in innocent until proven guilty. She believes that people are due their day in court. And she probably wanted to try to get a better verdict for him. And she tried to do her best without lying or perpetrating mm -hmm. fraud on the court. OK, which yes. is very important. You can't get up there and say things, you know, are not true. OK, that's yes. something we cannot do as lawyers. And she took that seriously. Candor um, to the tribunal, which is, by the way, I respect that because we've seen so many cases where I am highly questioning whether or not the, especially the prosecutors in some of these cases, I'm thinking the Potter trial and the Rittenhouse trial, whether they are openly lying to the court. That, that, but that's, that's a, just a question. I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying I've just questioned it at times. Yeah. So, and she also like mentioned YouTube comments in her closing. And so she was aware of the media attention kind of around the case. So, which, I mean, I feel bad for her. That's, that sucks, you know, like in one yeah, of your yeah. worst, toughest cases, everybody's watching you. That's, that's not great for anybody, but mm -hmm. all right, let's transition quickly into some politics and I'll kind of narrow it down because I have no idea how long this camera is going to last. Um, I, it, it could shut off at any minute. And if it shuts off, Andrew will take us out. I may try yes, to jump I on my you, computer guys. and and go in, but so politics, I'm here for lobby days. Um, I am involved in the FJA, which is the Florida Justice Association, which is Florida mm -hmm. PI lawyers. We get to go, come up here and talk to reps and senators about bills that are on the docket, basically to be debated and talked about. 
And I'll just stick to one that I think is very interesting. Florida is the only state that has the free kill bill, which is what we call it with wrongful death cases in med mal. Mm -hmm. If you're above, I think it's 26 years old and your mother dies and there are no dependents under 26 years old. Or um, if you're, if you die and you have no dependents under 26 years old, your parents can't recover or adult children can't recover. Even if the doctor is absolutely medically negligent, we are the only state out of 50 to have that. Mm -hmm. So we are here fighting against that, obviously, trying to get mm -hmm. them to repeal that, trying to get them to yes. put other parameters around that. There are other laws and bills we're dealing with and stuff, too. But what do you mm -hmm. think about that? And I want to know what people in the chat think about the fact mm -hmm. that because we have support from both sides at this point. Um, usually yeah. the left leaning representatives and senators are more with the plaintiffs, personal injury lawyer. But we've got a lot mm -hmm. from both sides that are supporting this because it just makes sense. And we're the yeah. only state that doesn't have it at this point. Yeah. And, that, and that's what makes it really weird. It's like, okay, well, whenever you have an outlier like that, you have one state that has a law, you're like, okay, well, why do we have this? Like at what point, what special interest, what lobby group, you know, was it the plaintiff's lawyers was, the, you know, at what point did this come from? Where's the genesis of that? In fact, and by the way, I don't practice PA like Peter. So this is the first right. time that I've actually heard of this very specific bill. That's a very specific Most people don't opinion. know. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. Now you're telling me about that. That's absolutely ridiculous. And just thinking about that logically, I'm trying to spin my wheels here. To think, you don't have any kids, right? No. <laughs> so, so, so some doctor, some doctor yeah. kills you on the table. Yeah. No matter how much money you're going to make in your life, that's just gone. Nobody's getting that. Nobody can recover that. Not your parents, not your sister. That's, nobody. That's preposterous. My, you know, my brothers, my mother, you know, everybody who would love even that. Even if you know, you're like, helping them, even if you're supporting, like exactly. even if you're paying the mortgage, but it doesn't matter. Exactly. And that's the whole thing. It's like, oh, it's okay. So as a society, are we not expecting like people as they, you know, are adults to support their aging family. In fact, by the way, spoiler alert, guys, we're all going to have to do that demographically, you know, whether we do it to the government or whether we do it to the private, you know, private citizens, we are all going to have to support the older generations more and more because of just the way demographics work out. There's more of them than us. So we're, so we're going to have to pay for it. Like it's not free, you know, and the, the costs are going up in case you haven't checked. So um, <laughs> that stuff that, that absolutely needs to be addressed. And look, if it's a wrongful death, a doctor, you know, and I have many friends who cover med mal, many friends who do, in fact, my friends in Orlando do like the most egregious cases um, mm -hmm. that are very meritorious of having a claim that goes to, you know, a mother, sister, brother, somebody else, um, because the doctor did something absolutely egregious. I mean, we're talking, you know, um, it left a tool inside of you, then went oh, back yeah. and left a different tool inside of you. Yep. You know, it's even larger and, and worse. And then you get an infection and die. Um, that so, sort of situation. So when we get to Tallahassee and we get to talk to these people, they all are politicians, right? So they're all like, oh yeah, that's great. Have I met you before? Thank you so much. Yeah, this is so great. But what do you think about the lobbying process? Like, Oh, it is, it, it is, is so annoying. It is so annoying. I, I, I can never do it because I can't lie to people's face like that. I can't blow smoke, you know, at them, uh, you know, uh, up the rear oh, end and then, what's and great then about turn us around and vote against them. Yeah. And they know why we're there. So it's easy yes. for us to come in and have this conversation. They know what our group is there. And then big insurance obviously has lobbyists that come in and do the exact opposite of what we're doing. Like we're trying to get mm -hmm. mandatory uh, bodily injury coverage instead of the no fault and whatever. There are a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about on a different um, conversation, but there is mm -hmm. so much money in lobbying. It is insane how this works. And just the part of the political process that you know, because you're big into politics and you know how yes. the world goes around with this stuff. It has a disproportionate effect vis-a-vis uh, -vis actual uh, public share, public, I would call it us the stakeholders, because we're actually the stakeholders who are paying for this, number one, by financing it through our taxes, but also, you know, through the consequences. We are feeling the consequences of this. And the amount of impact that we have through our calls, through our, you know, phone calls or letters or emails pales in comparison to the lobbyists that are there 24 seven in their ear and giving them actual drafts of legislation. This is the thing. They make their jobs easier as corporate counsel. I've been on these industry groups and I've been on the other side guys. And we give them, we tee up the legislation for them. We write it for them. They don't have to do anything. We're like, here it is. Sign this. They don't even know and what it says half the time. No, it'll be hundreds of pages long. They don't, they don't read it. And they might have an aide read it and summarize it for them, but they're not actually reading it. They have no idea the specifics in it, even though a lot of them are lawyers. So they do have the, the capability yeah. to know. However, they don't actually know is the real key. Yeah. And it is crazy. And that's one of the things we do. We explain boots on the ground type of deal, how this stuff works in life. 
and how this mm -hmm. stuff works in the real world. And we bring victims of this stuff and we say, listen to what happened to this person and nobody, their parents can't do anything about it. They get nothing mm -hmm. for pain and suffering, nothing, even though this doctor was drunk in surgery or whatever it may be, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Like, cause, the, cause it's just a bar. That's why they call it the free kill bill, which is, you know, pretty terrible name, but pretty accurate. Yeah, but Peter, so do, would, would you have a proposed solution? Or is there anything you can think of brainstorming? Having gone through this process, having doing this now, you know, a little bit of experience, is there anything that you would say would help the climate with lobbyists, help kind of tamp that down from your experience and in your opinion? Well, I can tell you what some of the compromises are we're talking about. And that mm. is if the, if the person, if the survivor was dependent on them, right? Dependent mm -hmm. on the deceased. And that dependency though, if defined by law, has to include more than just you pay a little bit of their mortgage or you give them some support or some money. They basically have to be living at your house. And the parameters they want to put on dependency is if they have a mental or phys mental incapacity or physical disability, which is mm -hmm. just not, not in my opinion, going to get the job done. Like it can't just be people that are dependents. And this is why right. you're right. People need to call their legislatures and say, we need to change this law. This needs to be not just dependents. This needs to be people, if their families, if a doctor is negligent, because we have to prove there are so many hurdles. We have to go mm -hmm. through so many hurdles. We have to get a similarly situated doctor to testify against them that it was me medically negligent. We have to prove what the negligence is. We have to prove the what barrier. the compensatory, the economic damages, what the non-economic damages are. We have to prove all that still. It's not just like, Oh, because I'm a plaintiff's lawyer and I say, you know, Dr. Andrew screwed up. Now he's got to pay my client a bunch of money. There are caps. Right. There are all sorts of stuff we have to deal with, but just barring claims altogether because you're 26 and not 23, it mm -hmm. makes no sense in my opinion. And, and, that, that's and, the and, and I guess the, the problem is they need to hear that coming from regular people. They need to hear that coming from real people, not just coming from you guys or, you know, Morgan or whatever else, because, exactly. you know, there's a certain perception of the plaintiff's bar that, hey, you know, these guys are just these money hungry contingency fiends and, you know, they're not actually looking out for the best interest of, you know, X, Y, Z. So they need to hear it from regular people and they need to hear that this is a serious issue that they actually will vote on. And, hey, you know, we will swing our vote if this is big enough. That this is going to change my vote. I will vote against you if you do not vote for this. Uh, exactly. You need to go there. Right. And you should look at all of them, not just the ones. I mean, the ones that we're here testifying about and talking about are the ones that we work with every day and the ones we're familiar with. But you look at them yourself, wherever you guys live, and you call your local representatives and you can talk to them about whatever is going on where you live. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Let's get to a few questions here before I die. <laughs> all right. Nice sweater, Peter. It looks great. How cold could it be in Florida? Listen, I'm in Tallahassee. It's cold and rainy, but I am sweating inside here now. Cause I've been blowing all this hot air. Um, <laughs> all right. So we didn't talk about this in Edgecombe. He thinks the judge will give the max sentence. What do you think? Um, I'm not convinced on max sentence. I think he'll give an above average sentence. I don't think he's going to give them necessarily. I, I wouldn't say he's automatically going to give the max sentence. Um, however, I will say this. When you call the judge a racist before the trial and try to get him kicked off. Uh, I don't think he's going to take too kindly to you after yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah, that's not not ever great, but Smooth um, move. and they can still appeal the sentence based on that, no matter what the yes. sentence is. But I'm I'm thinking something like, and this is actually common I've heard in these cases because I've talked to some people up there. I know some lawyers up there where they get something like 40 years in prison, 20 years supervised release after prison. So you can get mm -hmm. out after 40 years, but then you still have the supervised release or probation or whatever you want to call it, where you're still under the thumb for the mm -hmm. for the next 20 years. And I think he's in his 30s, mm -hmm. so. I mean, I guess that's a potential chance he gets out one day. There's a chance he gets 25 years or something like that and actually has a real chance at life. But yeah, I there's a true possibility. <laughs> and sentencing is April 8th. So we'll definitely yes. talk about it. Tune um, in for that. Yeah, at that point. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, Could make a lot of statements today, not a lot of questions. Yeah, exactly. We've got a lot of those. So, well, right, and, and gonna... I get, I understand at this point, guys, like a lot of people feel, you know, after it's done, it's like it's concluded, but there's still, there's still questions lingering out there. And just because things went this way in Edgecombe's case doesn't mean they're going to go this way in every single case. Definitely not. I mean, this is absolutely a case by case basis kind of thing. Like self defense mm -hmm. is absolutely a totality of the circumstances and case by case basis sort of thing. Oh, and Grump, I see Grumpy Cat uh, near the end here said, "Who called the judge a racist?" Uh, that was be, that was the defense, the, the defense, of, the defense attorneys. They uh, attempted to have the judge removed before the trial. 
And that happens a lot, like have, have, trying to have judges yeah. removed. Usually you don't call them a racist in the motion, but. Um, let's Some see. people are bold. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, that's, that is. Fortune favors the bold. Is that is that the saying? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, people saying it looked like see, he was auditioning see, for a job. I, I'm not gonna, see, I'm not going to. I won't go that far as saying totally inept. I'll say she, you know, I think Peter says she was not great. You know, I would have done stuff differently. There's stuff I would have improved. I think he's talking about now. he's talking about your boy B. Ivory Lamar. I think. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry, I was th- sorry. I was thinking uh, Halderson. Uh, no, no, no. B. Ivory. Yeah, okay. I'm more likely to agree with that. But I think, I think, like Peter said, B. Ivory is a different type of lawyer. I once in Miami when I was in court there, I was in criminal court and I was wa- sorry, civil court, and I watched a criminal lawyer trying to argue a civil case. It's like a fish out of water. It's a totally different strategy. It's totally different rules, totally different theory of the case. And it's different. They, they were messing up left and right. And this is the same thing for B. Ivory. He was like, just not, it was apples and oranges. He was arguing something like he was at a, you know, NAACP speech or something like that. All right, let's see here. So this is interesting for Michael Palmer. It's a ridiculous story that he was actually hit by the car and flew onto another vehicle, an accident nobody saw, just like the knife no one saw and the racial slur no one heard. Yeah, the whole getting hit by the car, assuming that's true. That's ridiculous. That's true, Peter, that have you have the you, story for you? But come on, have you driven a bike before and been hit by – like have you had a bike – bikes get bent so easily. There's I have had, no way. I've had cases mm-hmm. where people get hit on bikes all the time. Yeah, there's so no I know way there's no damage to the bike. The bike is not made of Usually like Wolverine's not. claws, like the adamantium, you know, steel. Like it's like ridiculous. Like, no, so there's no damage to the bike. And you said you, you know, he hit his head and he got bumped and stuff, but he had magically no injuries. Get out of here. I'm, nobody's believing any of that stuff at all. Yeah, I thought I didn't love that kind of theory of, well, all the stuff that just happened to not be caught on camera is all the stuff that's good for me. Because frankly, here's, here's the other thing too, Peter, is that where I'm from, we had people on bikes that would intentionally try to get hit in order to oh, call yeah. the cops and get a claim or get money out of you just oh, cash. Yeah. They'll be like, they'll like give me 200 bucks and I'll go away. Give me 300 bucks and I'll go away. They'll die. They'll literally intentionally come in front of you and to do that. So I oh, was very fine. suspicious of this argument. Okay. That's fine, John. Okay. We, I have 17 minutes. So we'll do, we'll go like 10 more minutes. Then we'll be good. Yeah, Sorry. I was good. talking to John, my buddy behind the camera is John. Hey John. Helping me out with this. Um, all right. So yeah, Brianna, um, this is the uh, the trial that put B. Ivory's name on the map. I I never heard of him before this, so she's right. I mean, it's and just, now he's a, he's a civil, he's a certified civil rights attorney after this. Yeah, I think so. And he can say I got to win. I kept him out of first degree murder and life in prison. All about the spin, baby. Uh, let's. And nobody's better at that than lawyers. Um, <laughs> let's see what else we got here. I don't like people disparaging. Uh, Ambulance chasing, although it's not—it's not what I do. But people like to throw that out there, and somebody said that about Lamar. Um, let's see what else we got here. So James Blonde 007, the defense spent the entire hour uh, recreating a new strategy, shameful to use Ahmad Arbery's name. I agree, yeah, and it did it, feel it, like they were. It's to the detriment ahead. to use to use facts that don't apply. It it hurts your case. Well, it's also, it's weird to have all these different strategies, but sometimes you have to, as a criminal defense, you have criminal defense lawyer, you have to have these alternative strategies where it's not um, necessarily streamlined because you're sometimes rightfully so throwing a bunch of crap up against the wall and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Hate to say and that, it, but sometimes and that's, that's all you need. You just need one reasonable doubt. So if there's five theories of the case, the one's got to stick. And Brianna, again, so Edgecombe didn't talk during the trial. I assume she means while sitting at council table. And I actually noticed that too, which is something that did come into play where I'm saying it didn't feel like they went to the jail and sat around a table and talked strategy of the case. It didn't feel like they were really cohesive as a team. Um, While uh, Lamar wanted to make it seem like it was like, he was real comfortable with me because I went and talked. It's like uh, objection. We can't talk about what you guys all talked about prepping for trial and how nervous he was to do this, but cool with you. He was, it was very weird stuff that they tried to get into like behind the scenes stuff that was never testified to. Um, but yeah, I didn't feel like Edgecombe was, you know, whispering in their ear saying, no, this didn't happen or ask him about this or anything like that. No, it was totally different than if you saw during Rittenhouse or Potter, when they were like constantly leaning over, talking to them completely different. Halderson didn't talk much to his lawyers either. Well, I mean, 
<laughs> or his lawyers say. are probably like, stay over there, please. Yes, yes. I don't um, want to hear anything. Yeah. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Some people agree with me about the judge. Some people love the judge. I'm not sure if I said I loved the judge, but some people. I think I'm a little bit more. You said you love the judge. I'm like I'm like a nine on the judge, and and you know I think you're like probably like a seven. You know. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, that is fair. So other people saying they split the baby um, with the verdict. I love that. I love love the Schroeder. (laughs) That's so good. Um, and yeah, somebody else said, somebody else said, oh, they didn't believe what he said. They just, some people probably wanted first degree. Some people, pro- people probably wanted not guilty. And you got to understand this is Milwaukee. We probably had some super woke guys on there that wanted to, that you, you couldn't have those SJWs that were like, you know, we want to let this guy off. They might've wanted to nullify the jury verdict. So maybe it was a real splitting the baby on here, you know, to come with reckless. We don't know. We weren't in that jury room. We haven't, and I have not yet heard jurors start coming out. And of course, Peter, tell me how much do you believe jurors and what they say um, post decision? Like when they're out there, you know, about to pitch their book or their spiel or their story. How oh, much I do believe, you believe that. You believe I believe them. them. I believe what they say. Yeah. I think because they know that there were only 12 people back there. And if they do tell a blatant lie, somebody's going to come out and say something about it most likely. Cause mm. there are some people, at least some people that are on every jury that take it extremely seriously and take the process extremely seriously, which is what we want. So if you go out there and make a joke of it to make a name or make your 15 seconds of fame on TikTok, yeah. somebody's going to be offended by that. So I do think that at least most of what they say is true. I think they can embellish about how important that's they were in where the jury going, room. Yes, 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 yes. That's where it is. The, the, the fish tail gets bigger when it comes to their own personal importance and also some of the things they did that can exaggerate a little bit about you know certain details. Correct. But what I think, okay, about this whole splitting the baby and some, I don't think some wanted not guilty and compromised for reckless. You're right. I I don't don't know know that, but I would be very surprised if there were some in there that were like, he didn't do anything. He doesn't deserve this. Fine. Let's give him first degree. Peter, we, we had the case in Florida where literally they said, we are not doing this because the guy's black. Like we don't want to send a black man to jail. You remember that one? The, I forget the name of the case. And that can happen. Right. Right. But that happened recently. Yeah, I don't know which case you're talking about, but that can happen. Sure, that can happen. But that's what I'm saying. I don't think that's what happened here because they ended up agreeing on a lesser included, but I don't think it was the least included, right? There was second degree. Um, But I think that the defense at least gave them something to hold on to when it came to reckless. So the ones that did want a conviction could at least say, fine. He admitted Mm -hmm. he shot him. He said it was an accident. So this, this fits right in here. So this is what we should convict him of. So I do think that yeah, was. I think I, I think I sent you it sent you the article here, but it was Deontay um, Rosillas. Um, I can't okay. I can't pronounce his name, but the Fort Lauderdale case, Fort Lauderdale case. Okay. This is this is literally like very recent uh, jury notification. So yeah, interesting. I can't believe the defense tried to submit evidence on a Saturday. Listen, okay, let me just tell you something real quick about that. The state does this all the time, and they get state. to do it. Because their excuses are always legitimate because they're the government. And they say, judge, it was impossible for us to get this because if we could have, we would have. So don't, don't hate on the defense attorneys for trying to do it once in a while, especially. And again, that is just more evidence that this was not prepared as a group well enough because they didn't have what Dr. Black wanted to use in his testimony. This easily should have been submitted way ahead of time. But my guess is they didn't have it because they didn't prep with Dr. Black until the trial was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And we saw, we've seen this in other cases. We've seen this in Rittenhouse. We've seen this in other cases and they will end up ultimately allowing it in. Um, but yes, I believe it should go both ways. And that's part of due process, guys. We have to be equal. Whether or not we think the guy is, is guilty, whether the facts lean one way or another, we have to give it to both sides in a trial. That's part of the rule of law. That's part of our system. And that's why our system is one of the best systems in the world, because we actually adhere to these rules. There's lots of countries. I'm going to cover um, the case of Greg Kelly in Japan, where there's just lip service to this stuff. They actually do not give both sides equal weight. The prosecution gets way more weight to this. So we should thank God we live in America. Thank God for state of florida especially you know that we stand for the rule of law yeah i mean people that think some of this stuff is unfair don't know what it's like in other countries i mean yes it's it's totally unfair um and then we got some halderson conversations about how great the opening was how the prosecutor crushed it the timeline was awesome the way he moved through witnesses was awesome pig roast could have been a pig roast (laughs) true again and that's something that but i mean that's like 
at least something you could say as the defense attorney. Like, <laughs> how do you know he wasn't roasting a pig? Yeah. How do you know someone else wasn't roasting a pig? In that? You don't exactly. have no clue. Exactly. Because that's the other thing. We've all smelled somebody grilling something outside. I don't know which house it's coming from always, unless I see a big smokestack, which they said they did see from that. But mm -hmm. at least something. Um, all right, let's see. And yeah, other people saying, yeah, I can tell they didn't save or protect stuff for appeal. All right, let's see what else. That's why you throw got. an objection out there every once in a while. That's why you make those motions to dismiss. That's why you, you know, you, you just make them. You just make them, you know, um, because that's an appeal issue. And if you file a motion pre suit or pre trial and lose, you still have to object during trial in order to protect it for appeal. Mm hmm. All right. Why am I lying about? All right. What else we got here? Anything else? There was one uh, question about um, attorney's duty it. to um, past clients or after a case closes their duties to the client. Yeah. So of course there's certain things, there's a duty of confidentiality, everybody that still lingers even after somebody's no longer your client. So, you know, there's certain things that we will never know from the attorneys about the representation of these defendants, especially the ones that are guilty, like, for example, Halderson or Edgecombe. There's certain things that if Edgecombe told his, his B. Ivory or Halderson told the public defenders, we're never going to know that because they cannot disclose that to us. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and that's not the type of information I'm going to get from her. The type of information I'm talking to her about is more like, what was your strategy? What were you guys trying to yeah. do? And I'll, I'll just let one cat out of the bag. There is a specific motion you have to file there. You can't, like in Florida, if I think Andrew did it and not my client, I can just put people on the stand and be like, yeah, Andrew was there too. I think Andrew did it. Andrew could have mm -hmm. done it. He had the same gun. He drove the same car. He had the same tire marks, whatever it may have been. He's got the training. There, you have to file a motion and you're not allowed to point the finger at somebody unless there's enough evidence and the judge lets you point a finger at that person. And then the state also can combat that because they know what you're coming with and there can't be any surprise or anything like that coming at trial, which is not necessarily how it is in Florida. So there mm -hmm. are different rules and they couldn't just say the girlfriend could have done it. The girlfriend right. had this or that or whatever, which a lot of people were commenting. Maybe she had took a part in it. They legally, according to her and what they try to do pre-trial, they could not point the finger at somebody. So again, that's something that we on the outside. And this is also something she said to me, which I've said on tons of videos, nobody knows the case like the lawyers do. Mm -hmm. This is not your case, Andrew. This is not my case. No, nope. I know my case is better than anybody else does. And she knew this case better than we do. And that's a fact. And that's the truth. That's true. So, so an argument that, you know, we all sitting out here in the YouTube world are like, oh, they could have pointed the finger. Actually, they couldn't have. So mm -hmm. that's just kind of a, a snippet of the kind of stuff we'll be yeah, talking we'll, about. Yeah, we'll give and we give them that credit. But at the same time, we have to bring up the other things. And, and look, if they are what they are, then, you know, that that that's the way that the law works. And maybe, hey, maybe there needs to be a change of law in that state. Maybe they need to take away those requirements. These are good policy things which people can lobby. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that when it comes down to it, a lot of this stuff has to do with just lawyers doing their jobs and doing the best that they can. And every case is not perfect. And you don't understand what everybody's going through. But, you know, we we do our best to kind of break it down. And I try to stay objective. Mm -hmm. And we try to just kind of say yeah. what lawyers may be thinking and what we may do differently and stuff like that. But in reality, we give props to lawyers, to us trial lawyers. It's the hardest job in the world. It's so stressful, especially with all eyes on you, your client's life in your hands. This stuff is hard, right? And yes. so, you know, I think we have to understand that, especially all of us behind a camera or or keyboard don't necessarily understand what it's like in all of these situations. So I think we have to come with it with a little bit of grace always with this kind of thing. And, and that's why I love talking to you, Peter, because it's very good. We can, you know, steel man these guys as much and make the best argument as we can for them and say, Hey, look in their defense, this in their defense, that, and I think we've done that. I think we've given everybody a fair shake. We think we've even said, Hey, B ivory, here's your next career. You should consider moving into it because it's very profitable. I hope, I hope he watches these videos and I hope he makes himself a very successful. <laughs> I lawyer. doubt these probably might watch yours. <laughs> maybe, maybe a hate watch if you will. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's, I, I think we do do that. I think we give them a fair shake, you know, and a fair assessment. And hey, as a lawyer, I'm always looking to improve. So I would look at these if I was the public defenders in Halderson, if I was whatever, whoever took a loss here or perceives himself as taking a loss, I would watch these videos and say, okay, well, is this something I can genuinely improve on or is this not? Is this an unfair or is this, is this fair? You know, is this something that's banned by the rules or it's not? Always be improving in your life. And I think no matter where you are, no matter what you are, lawyer or not, I think you'll be on the right track. Absolutely. And I think that's a great place to end. So Andrew, tell everybody where they can, you do a, a stream every night, right? Yes. Every night. Not
I just dropped my mic here. <laughs> I, got, I was like, I was like getting ready to talk about YouTube jail. Um, so I am technically in YouTube jail, guys. Oh, that's uh, right. I said some, I said some no-no stuff, but I'm in YouTube jail for a week. Uh, I will be back though next week on YouTube. My channel is The Legal Mindset. Find me over there. Go subscribe to me. That'll really help me out and uh, save me from Susan. But if you want to find me in the interim, I'll be posting stuff on alt tech platforms. But the main place you can find it is legalmindset.locals.com. Um, that is the easiest way to, to find me, legalmindset.locals.com. Um, easiest way to find me. Go over there. You can follow for free. You can support me if you want. Um, but I'll post stuff either through Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, or a stream on Locals itself. I'll be doing that for the next couple of days and next week. Uh, and then I'll be back on YouTube. But I have like uh, no idea what any of that stuff is. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, awesome, it's, all, it's all the platforms that let me talk about all the stuff that I get in trouble for. Because, you know, okay. Peter, sometimes I just can't shut my mouth. All right. And uh, I will be back eight o'clock. I'm sorry, four o'clock on Friday, four Eastern for my weekly live. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Halderson. We'll talk about some other stuff on Friday. So make sure you join back in there. Check out our other videos. Check out Andrew's page. Make sure you subscribe to him as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this live. It was a lot of fun. If you're still with us, hit the like button and subscribe. I don't know if I said that at all throughout this video because I always forget. But Andrew, it was fun, man. Flew by. Yeah, no, Appreciate good. It, Catch you again. Catch you on my channel. All right. See ya.